Alejandro, Shaky Graves. Great to see you, man. I know you're uh, you're running some some errands around uh, town. Where, where where are you off to today? Um. Well, I'm sort of in the uh, pre album release, trying to pretend that I'm at home, uh, still having to do a lot of shit. <laughs> Uh, moment of my life where I'm I'm running like very very bizarre errands um, around town. I just mailed off a bunch of like posters I had to sign and some weird like handwritten lyrics, which sound like a very cool object. And you're like, oh, I'd love to handwrite some lyrics, and then you realize how much shit you say in a song. Sometimes <laughs> you're like, dude, isn't nightmare. it crazy how hard handwriting is after like we haven't done it in, since grade school and now no one does it and it's like it takes forever there's some of the some of the things that i wrote are like <laughs> it's like five r box x t r and it's like that word is chair and they're like fuck wow but you know i'm hoping that the 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 sort of like uh artistic value outweighs maybe the uh I don't know, archival significance of it. <laughs> like, I'm hoping that no one in the future is trying to be like, ah, the sacred document or something like that, because I don't think they can read it. Yeah, well, I, I I feel we all talk in code in our in our handwriting. And my mom, you know, I, I think my mom legitimately thought I was special ed for the first five years of grade school because I just couldn't write. And I was like good at writing, but the words just didn't make any sense on the on the page. So uh, but I, you know, as time moves on and we all become closer to robots and cyborgs, I think, you know, I think people like handwritten shit. They like handmade shit. I think that's a thing, right? Yeah. Oh, I love I I, I live and die by handmade shit. I mean, it's kind of like, uh, say, 40 percent of my body is just handmade shit. Yeah. And 60 percent is cyborg. Yeah. Nice. Slash well, water. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's right. I for- Do you, Is it true that um, I heard this fact a few times that your 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 body re- recycles Mine? itself like every seven years no i mean human humans um y- you know your body you're, you're all new matter in seven years because your body sheds and recycles itself does that make sense yeah i'm not because as i said before i'm 60 percent cybernetic organism and then 40 yeah. percent handwritten shit so it's usually kind of like more of a the handwritten part of me changes, I'd say, every like five years, and then the cybernetic organism thing doesn't ever change. So, hey, I respect that. You got to do what you got to do to to keep up in this madness, <laughs> you know, Alejandro. I all, I do know that I yeah. do. I do as a as kind of a quote unquote lo fi guy, or you know, someone who's kind of known for recording at home uh, some of your records and and um, recording to yeah. tape. I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong, but how how is all this tech stuff? kind of rubbed you it's like do you do you have you adopted some of it have you like made a lot of compromises with like records and and just art in general and like using some of the the fancy polish or do you kind of want to stick to your guns oh god well um (laughs) i don't know i'm pretty duplicitous about all this stuff um like on one hand i'd say you know I, i i recorded onto tape for years part of it was definitely based on uh what i had access to and the other side of it is is that uh, you know i think that like for for me uh i always grew up drawing you know like i was a uh i would not say i was a visual artist but i was a drawer that used to be the old my term for for visual artist but i I really like I, i grew up on uh like basically a pretty significant diet of like the far side and calvin and Hobbes, mm-hmm. and so i really uh wanted to be an animator when i was little and um still do kind of feel like that's my like damn it mom why didn't you force me to be a lawyer thing or whatever but instead it's like why didn't you let me be like a soulless line animator you know for the cartoon network or something? <laughs> sure sure i think she was right but um but there's like a pretty specific process that I've always really enjoyed with having to duke out physical media uh, of any sort, like the mistakes, the kind of like continuous, you know, make or break moments that you have to do. And so the same goes with audio. Like um, I learned how to make stuff on tape and then no matter what, even from when I first started to make it on tape, your goal when you start to work with a cassette tape or something usually is like, 
it'd be great if this was just this flawless, again, meticulous tape that someone could find down the line and be like, can you believe that, you know, Florida Georgia line wrote that whole song just on a single tape or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reality is that, you know, I would, I would get as much as I could and then I would always dump it into like a shitty computer. So I've always had a digital side of stuff. I think even still, no matter what, I'm doing an interview. Who that? It's uh, my buddy who <laughs> who works at the bar that I snuck into the back of. <laughs> oh, nice. I think he's he's a little surprised that I'm out here. I'll be in there soon. So to the the whole uh rollout process of an album is that is that something that you look forward to like the chatting to people, the admin side of shit or is that just like, oh, crap, I have to do um no it's a little bit of both i mean honestly like look I'm, I'm way off in the weeds with the whole digital analog thing right now but it's actually a really important thing of uh that 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 i i kind of need to talk about with this with this current album rollout um because i've done a lot of stuff analog in the past and basically like the short story of it is that it taught me how to um it's the term turn shit into shinola so it is like bad, it's basically yeah. thanks is like I, I was really good at making terrible tape recorded stuff sound audible um and that's like a skill that i've kind of had to learn to just get these sort of magical moments that i've found throughout making music and to be able to like translate them to somebody because i have a pretty high threshold for lo-fi music and i love weird obscure like the stranger and harder to find stuff is it really like that does get me going I, yeah I, I know i'm not alone with that but at the same time like i have a lot of what i would refer to as hissy bullshit <laughs> sure like, yeah, you yeah. listen to it and it's like wouldn't say <laughs> and i'm like man and i know where i was when i made it and um there's only certain people that are down to be subjected to that or find that cool at all you know so that's that's kind of like a specific <laughs> specific thing um there is a whole the, scene that just enjoys not hearing melody or anything that sounds like a song so look I, i've been part of that shit before yeah. like and i i think there's some songs that if i could hear the whole thing i think it would really like burst my bubble quite honestly mm -hmm. um and i'm also like a giant fan of outsider music and just really like uncomfortable bizarre stuff like found audio in general is something that i just cannot uh, get over i i think that like if you ever listen to those like songs in the key of z albums found audio is this a band what is it no just like oh just like field recordings and like for instance i i found a one of the weirdest pieces of audio i ever found i bought a i bought a little handheld like um voice memo recorder at some point second hand from a i think from a pawn shop like the and talk it, boy from home alone 2 I wish. Yeah. It was like the cool futuristic version of that. You know, it was like a it looked like a it looked like a vape pen at this yeah. point. But, but at that point, back then we didn't have vape pens. We had bongs. Um and <laughs> smoke and analog. <laughs> exactly. And I I pulled the audio off of it and it was a woman who um <laughs> it was a recording of a woman who had gotten grifted by a dry or a carpet cleaning service and she was trying what does to grifted mean? like she was swindled okay like she had paid for a carpet cleaning service and they took her money and didn't mm -hmm. give her the, the carpet cleaning so she was trying to catch this guy on the phone uh named mr dixon and it was her just calling this guy over and over again and recording the conversation <laughs> and she's like hello mr dixon this is cheryl king uh calling again this third time this week uh about the carpet cleaning service that i paid you like 58 dollars for but that i never received and it's like him trying to get away and get around from the thing. And it, it was like a 20 minute recording of her calling over like two months. And finally he like screamed at her and stuff. And um, is this from the fifties or, or 60s? I, I bet it's, uh, it might as well have been, it's like probably circa 2003, you okay, know, nice, like 120 nice. years ago. That's right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but at some point I remix, I put that into a, I put it like I made a beat you know, on my computer and put it over the back of it and have always forced. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Cause that's what you do. Um, Dude, it's so fun, but stuff like that, like, you know, there's, 
again, there's these compilations called Songs in the Key of Z that that are like outsider music uh, compilation stuff. And it's it's like, you know, it has household favorites like Daniel Johnson, but then it has like really bizarre shit. Like there's this song called Moon Pilot that's just by Unknown that sounds like somebody got an answering machine <laughs> tape mm-hmm. and found an old man playing a song called Moon Pilot. It's one of my favorite songs. So that whole mindset of going into like lo-fi stuff, hi-fi stuff, this album that I'm doing right now, we ended up recording a bunch of like, we set out to make songs, but in the process, the way we recorded the album is that we just kind of left everything recording the whole time. So I ended Mm. up with like every day we did, we did three sessions that were a week long each and every day since we were kind of exploring and didn't really know what we were going to make. I was like, well, why don't we just set up stations and run microphones from like the moment we go in until we leave. And then I'll just sift through the rest. So for the last like two years, what I've been doing is uh, using a, a digital medium because if this was all tape, I would have shot myself. Yeah. And going through and kind of editing these massive days of music and going through them and making notes and then basically finding songs that we didn't even realize we were making in the studio or using that weird skill that I learned mm. of like shit, shit to Shinola to like find a single moment that was recorded in like glistening digital hi-fi and then take it out and repeat it or mix it or find another moment that matched up with it and then basically turn them into stuff that we didn't even try and do. So Fun. this album turned into a lot of albums. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I've never heard of that process. You're basically like blowing up the whole process and re reinventing it. That's pretty cool. Putting it together backwards, so to speak. Well, it gets even weirder. Um so I started to show these sessions to people when I started to make them, like my friends at home. And people were like, so what does the album sound like? And I was like, okay, well, this is day five of session two, hour 28, you know, like, and somewhere in here, we're, some, we're working on this one song that I'll show you in a second. But we're, th- today we were talking about what if this song was like in a sad part of a movie where somebody's like husband left them. And uh, that's the, but it's a theme from a different thing. And they were like, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. And <laughs> And eventually I showed it to one of my friends and just kind of put it on the background while we hung out. And he was like, and I kept kind of like making platitudes about how I'd slice it up or, you know, change whatever. And he was like, I don't know, I would listen to this. And he's like, if you put it on a SoundCloud or some shit or just put this out, he's like, I'm down. He's like, it sounds great. You don't have to. He's like, I'd listen to the long version if you if if you put it out. I was like, (laughs) what? You know, like what? And so I started to try and think about like how I could put out all the versions of every song that we did. And I came up with this idea that like I started working with a web team to where we built a thing that's going to launch the day that this album comes out that uses, you know, like they wrote code for it. Um, But basically it, it puts like track one is called limbo. Right. So there's, while we made that song, there's like the demo I made, the first really well-recorded rough version that was a little bit slower but didn't have certain parts. Then there's like weird swipes we took at it. Then there's like early alternate lyrics that's just drum and bass. There's like tons of versions. So it takes that, makes it a bracket. There's 10 versions of that song. Song two, same thing. Song three, same thing. So then it scrambles them all and basically just poops out randomized albums of like basically a, a, around a hundred songs at this point. Holy shit. So do you have yeah. like to, to sit through like days of recordings? Do you have kind of that? Like, I don't know what you'd call it. Like eight, Sado, eight sadomasochistic. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to find the words like that would be, I don't know. that might help. Like it, that might be nice to like get out of your own head and get out of the madness of the world to like go through stuff. And it's, it's nice to have a mission like, just recording at home the past couple of weeks has just helped me enormously get out of a massive brain funk. Is there that something go. where you're like, are you enjoying that? Where you're like sifting through hundreds of hours of stuff? You love that? Okay. Oh, well, and it, it, you know, that's the other thing is like, I, I've done a lot where it's just me. So it's like been my, my output, having to edit my own voice, having to do just like constant, just listen to myself do shit, which yeah. is fine until it's not. But 
this time around I had a whole like six piece band and these are like some of my favorite musicians that I know. And so, you know, I got to be a lot more of a director as opposed to just having it focus entirely on me. Like I would mm -hmm. like write a melody, like absolute shit on a piano and then show it to my friend who is like a genius at keys and synths, And he'd be like, <laughs> you know, and then mm -hmm. I would just say like, keep doing that. And so then we would record all this stuff and like, there's no way while we were doing it, I would have ever been able to notice all this cool shit that was happening. But then going back through it, it's like I basically just mute my own voice <laughs> and listen to all of these amazing musicians I brought in play like wild stuff. And then like got re-inspired from things that they found in the melody that I brought. And then so it really turned into something totally different. And and it 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 makes it to where going back in and like editing all of these different versions for this weird like multiverse thing that I built it doesn't hurt so much because I don't have to just listen to myself run into a wall for hours. It's like, interesting. It's bigger what, than that. Yeah. What about like, so if you're not, you know, submersing yourself in music, what, what kind of, what do you get pumped about? Oh God. What do I get pumped about right now? Really bizarrely enough, I get really pumped about tennis. I'm okay. Really, really, really into the sport. Have you read Andre Agassi's book? No, I haven't. Oh, should, I, should I read the, Andre Agassi's book? Oh, dude, on, on, I mean, even for people who don't know shit about tennis like me, it's one of the best books I've ever read. Really? Yeah, it's hilarious. It's great. Uh, it's really well done. Yeah. Oh, Any, yeah. Yeah. Check out, check out Agassi's book. Wow. Holy shit. I absolutely will. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. this is a, like, uh, obviously i guess through this whole bizarre explanation you could probably take away that i'm somebody who like fixates slightly on shit <laughs> no doubt but it's good to be obsessed with stuff yeah Once you get it done you know yeah yeah 100 percent. but i don't know i've never like i didn't really grow up in like a giant sports family per se my dad was into football and stuff but and i i love like any activity you know challenging whatever I, i'm down with sports but it hasn't really like landed for me until about a year ago i started accidentally it's been essentially a year i i accidentally started watching the u.s open at an airbnb with my now wife and i was like the fuck is up with this sport and uh <laughs> i got sucked into it i watched a match between two guys this guy carlos alcaraz who's now he's like world number two he's he's like 19 he's a teenager or 20 and then this guy this guy from italy named yannick sinner and they played for like five and a half hours and i was just un wildly unaware that this was the kind of shit that happened in the sport and then forgot about it and then the australian open happened at the beginning of the next year and i have been watching it and then now playing it like constantly for like eight months oh no kidding yeah it's a hell of a workout yeah it's a lot and it's like i fucking hate working out i really really do and it but it's one of those things where it's like um there's something about the the battle of it and the mindset that reminds me more of trying to play music as a solo artist than any other mm. like analog sure. of a sport ever has because there's an audience yeah, yeah. watching you but it's like a lot of it's about you against yourself really when you're playing music for people isn't it so true and like the biggest cliche of all time in the arts is like it's why save me from myself is the like most cliche <laughs> stupid lyric of all time and save uh, me from myself. Me from myself. like it's, it's just like a, it's a butt yeah. rock classic like early 2000s butt rock really leaned into that one but I mean, uh it's true man fit, i mean yeah if the shit fits you know it's true the amount of like I mean, myself included, the amount of friends I have that just uh, super talented, that just, you know, self-sabotage, you know, don't want to get out the door. It's just like it is it's hard to explain. And, and I I struggle explaining it to to people because you don't want to feel ungrateful for being able to play music for a living or whatnot. But you do. You know, you lose your mind. I mean, I do. I really struggle with the mentals, especially with the travel and like yeah. the moving around and the so the socializing. I've really, 
really been yeah. struggling and like my body is like legitimately yeah. starting to reject it like i'm starting to get like <laughs> panic attacks like and hives like, and stuff yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i got a rash on my ass yeah it, but it, like legitimately you can have physical ailments manifest from your brain just butt fucking you and it, and it happens man and i sometimes i don't know how to get out of it like i'll go for a jog and like a sweater and that only gets you so far but uh mm -hmm. the best i ever feel is when there's like <laughs> there's like nothing on the calendar and that's yeah. like the best i've ever felt in my life you know man you and me fucking both yeah 100 percent. it's and it is it's a it's a very bizarre like and again i guess i guess this is why one of the reasons that I, I got so mesmerized by tennis is watching <laughs> watching these people who fight around the like mid 100s or like, you know, that aren't the like top 10, whatever, even the top 10 players in the world are still doing this like manic depressive psychotic where they like they all they do is work out or play mm. ten. They play this one game where they chase a the ball around. And like they can be doing so good and then you can lose it for yourself by like losing concentration or thinking about yeah, winning yeah. or like, and then the, it just resets. It's like, it's like, yeah, you won. And it's like, but you didn't win the tournament. And then even if you won the tournament, it's like the next tournament is the following week for the rest of the year, for the rest of your life until you either give up mm. or like become number one until you're not like, well, it's got to be the the most mentally unhealthy sport to be in because you're isolated. You got no one to relate yeah. to except like your mortal enemy standing across the net from you. <laughs> who, who you tour with all the time. You're on the tour with them. You see them. Yeah. And you're like, oh, God, it's uh, it's Stavlos Stavnovsky again. <laughs> like, and it then must Stavnos, be so weird. Stavnos uh, destroys you. And then you're like. He's actually a pretty nice guy. I like Stavnos. Yeah. And but then like, you have no one else to like, hang out with at the hotel bar. So you yeah, except for Ridiculous. people who are giving you like deep tissue butt massages that you pay right. to do that, but then like they're why you're going broke. It, it, it and somehow within all that is a great metaphor for for you know, it's like music can feel very much like that too. That it's like it I'm sure it's hard for tennis players to believe that people are actually fans of them or watch them do that like some random dude who plays music is like, Man, thank you. Mm -hmm. Like random slavic guy who i just learned their name who like really made my day better like i really really like you and it's like i know that person's not thinking about me they're probably trying to figure out how to pay for a hotel and like mm -hmm. but the same goes with like it's easy to disassociate from the fact that sometimes when we play music it matters a lot to people and it like that that before anyone ever listened to my music that was kind of that was my metric for success and it, it still to a certain degree is is that like if somebody hears what i heard at a certain point in my music and was like yeah i get it or like mm -hmm. cool that kind of just uh instantaneous sense of connection is something that's like really magical and then the more that it happens or or the, the on a larger scale it's easy to disassociate from that so Totally. I think, yeah, I think musicians probably more than anybody beat themselves up. And it's like, I have that thought all the time. Like, oh, what I do is selfish. I just do it for me. Yep. My job is fun. So it's not a real job. <laughs> yeah. And then you kind of yeah. like go down this trench and you and then, you know, you get a, you get nice mail from people and you're like, oh, like and sometimes it doesn't register because you're in your own bullshit being, you know, being a, a bitch about it. But sometimes I get messages from people and then you you have that moment where you're just like, oh, all right, cool. What I do actually has value people actually do care and it is a civil service even though maybe my, it might be considered a low form of civil service it is pretty important i mean <laughs> sure. i always say if like if there's no art i mean you got north korea you know so right you, you need art uh even though you know this government will probably never value it and and let's be honest most governments don't like france no. and canada that's a fluke like we can we can wish we were them all we want. But Canada for the is most not part... a fluke, okay? Okay, Canada is a very <laughs> well executed uh, hat. Or whatever. here's thirty. Here's thirty grand to make a record. That sounds pretty good. But yeah, um, that's thirty grand more than America gives us. That's for fucking. It's charity. amazing. It's amazing. And I and I and that should be celebrated for sure. But yeah, at the end of the day, I think if you are making money on art, like. Maybe I sound like a bitter old hack, but it it does it is almost like a fluke. Like the world is not set up for you to make any money on art. Like 
you're like defying the laws of socioeconomics if if it's happening. So I try to remember oh. that, and I try to just remember that this could all be very temporary, and it is all very temporary. We're all we're all temporary, but uh, yeah, making money off of art makes you instantly feel like Scrooge McDuck in sort of like a bad way. Like, even if you just make, like, 50 bucks, you're like, ha vault of gold, like... Oh, uh, yeah, I went through a like, phase of that. Not anymore, though. Now I walk home with, like, a sweaty wad of money in my pocket, wake up on a Sunday, and I, I never felt better, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> we got, got to get by to do this civil service, you know what I mean? Out here, like... <laughs> am I, oh, what What did you say was the, uh, the, the, the lyric, the great lyric? Oh, save me from myself. Save me from myself. That's yeah, it. Exactly. With all these crumpled up one dollar bills I own. What? What? Uh, I, one thing I like to ask is, uh, like, any great soul crushing stories from early on in the in the road endeavors on the toilet bowl circuit before before you caught some steam. Oh yeah, I mean, I I I toured on everything except for a horse. I feel like. Like a horse, sound, it sounds pretty bougie. My first touring vehicle was a um, toy '97 Toyota Corolla, and that thing was great. Um, yeah, and I would chase somebody's van around on the West Coast and play shows that, like, you know, the headliner was getting like 35 people in there, so like one who showed up too early would watch. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and it was just a lot of like put I mean honestly just a lot of putting the head down and trying to trying to believe in oneself, I guess a little bit or to 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 gain character kind of, you know, where you're like, well this will be a learning process. But it was a real uh you know, it's always been a real like trying to trying to keep your mind on the on the prize in the sense that like being being out on the road is the point like whether or not it's going well or not you know like you have to be learning from that experience in one way because it doesn't have to get more than that you know like i think it's really bizarre that i'm on a tour bus now because i i remember looking at a tour bus and just being like on what fucking planet do i get to live in like a moving Mm. apartment building and now i know all the like gross shitty stuff about tour buses like you can't shit on them Mm-hmm. We've had long, long conversations about who actually does get to shit on their tour bus. I don't know if you've ever really thought about this. No, tell me more. Well, like, if you shit on a tour bus, it breaks the tour bus. The whole thing catches on fire and it burns to the ground. That's good and to it's, know. It's just how they build them, I guess. But <laughs> there are definitely people who can get away with it. It's like, it's basically all tour buses are rented. So if you shit in them, they have to have some sort of grinder to destroy the, you know, mm. solids or whatever. And then it's somebody's job to clean that out. And so Oof. unless unless you're unless you're fucking killing it, someone's like the bus drivers and people who work for the bus companies are like, I'm not doing this. Like, it's not cool. going to happen. You're not going to pay me to like, you know, try and scrape the turds of insert confusing mid-grade Honey bands. Kravitz? <laughs> well that's the theory is like at lenny kravitz's peak does he shit on his bus or did he make it to a plane before he shat on the bus damn so i mean straight up if you're shitting on a tour bus you're just not a good guy or you're just you've you've done enough to where you can you can do it somebody can't like oh. elton john can probably shit on a bus like mm. he's earned it you know yeah yeah i i suppose so i mean i think that's pretty much the top of the mountain alejandro you know, people talking about making it, you know, like playing a theater or selling out clubs like that. That actually might be it. I, I'm not saying he would. You know, I'm not putting Elton in that position. But there are sometimes when you're like, I have to go. And then if you're like, hey, and also I'm paying like 13 grand a day or something insane for this lavish ass bus. That Come on, it can't back. be that much. Look, I don't know. I don't have a bus that has like there's some I that I know that there are buses like this that exist. You know mm-hmm. that like they have your whole house inside of them that your bus is like someone's Yeah, you know, it's like someone's room. You know, yeah, it's like a hotel Diddy room. bus. And at a certain point if you're like if that stops it shitting on it maybe this ain't the life for me, you know. Who would you most want to like have a have a drink with on your tour bus as far as like uh 
rappers rappers wow um alive or dead i guess does that yeah matter? yeah preferably I, I guess it would dead. be it would be it'd be buster rhymes it'd be buster rhymes. is he dead no he's just he's kind of chubby him, i get him mixed up with coolio who is dead coolio is definitely dead yeah damn wait who's the who's the guy um who's what did buster rhymes sing he sang um give me some mo and uh him and the flip mode squad did a well i guess that's kind of a deep cut we could take it outside uh put your hands where my eyes can see okay um anyway whatever a good answer good answer alejandro um (laughs) people like buster rhymes are you fucking serious yeah yeah yeah. he slips my mind what are your um you you know you go out for pretty long stretches of road what are your like what do you do to stay sane what do your mental wobbles look like how do you get around them Hmm. i don't know man um my mental wobbles look like you know self-imposed exhaustion from um just trying to you know keep my like psychic dick hard for a month nice um because i mean it is a lot it's like something i really think about is is certain bands or musicians that like their persona a hundred percent no matter what is a party um where it's like we're doing this you know like that's tough we we do backflips or whatever. And I think at a certain point, it's like, luckily I've sort of designed my art and my setup to where like, if I am having an off night or I feel tired, I can always just be like, we're going to be chill. And even if somebody's a little upset by it, it's not off brand or anything, you Mm -hmm. know, like a chill night is probably what, what somebody in the audience wants. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's really strange to be somebody who travels around and throws a party for everybody every night because for most for a lot of people like sometimes they go to a show a month or a year or a couple times a year and so it's like it's a big night for a lot of people and um it's sometimes right in the middle of all of my nights you know yeah sure so it it get it gets a little like yeah, it gets a little weird. It gets, and it's it's hard to tell sometimes. It's like if you feel bad about, if you're just feeling bad, if you're tired, or or things in your life are going sideways on you or whatever, it's really easy to like feel like an audience is sliding on you or like misunderstand a joke from stage or something. You know, like who knows? Like mm-hmm. weird shit you project pretty can project pretty bizarrely on the audience totally yeah i I have like the a deep fear of like letting people down kind of i don't know if that happens to you but just like (laughs) oh like my voice wasn't really great tonight i was struggling i'd crap you know struggled singing some notes uh and then you just (laughs) yeah you just obsess about it and they're like oh these people aren't going to give a shit next time i come through town yada yada so uh i don't know how do you get around that oh man i don't yeah i mean luckily I guess, you know, I was raised by dorky ass theater people, you know, so I, I, I ha- I've had a lot of adults talk to me about stage performance since I was like a little kid. And there's a certain aspect of it that, that I, I don't think it's necessary all the time, but like, it's perfectly fine to leave stuff on the stage, you know? And it's like, it's not duplicitous to pick stuff up the moment you walk onto a stage either. You know, and I I think music is very strange in the sense that it it can be, you you can be highly lauded for being super performative and like not being yourself, you know, like, like being Mm -hmm. like essentially like Lady Gaga or something like putting Mm -hmm. on as much of a persona as you want. And then you can be like, you know, Nick Cave or something, which is like, or John Moreland or, you know, like just be basically an exposed nerve that goes yeah. out and you know sings their heart out and both of these are like considered peak music in their own mm. regard and neither is better or more important than the other you know because it's about the, the catharsis that the audience experiences and audiences are looking towards people who are on stage to do whatever the shit they want <laughs> really mm-hmm. like that's something that i try and check myself back into also is that like 
when I go to see a show, no matter how like curmudgeon and shitty I am, I'm usually giving everybody the benefit of the doubt that they're going to do good. Yeah. I'm not like, I hope they come out here and fucking fall down and play the wrong notes. And you know, like sure. I'm, I'm in most people are rooting for you, especially if they paid money to come see your show. They're rooting for you. They want you to do something at least that you want to do kind of seems like, Oh, so yeah. So I'm, uh, I go to see the offspring with my pops and, uh, you know, he's going nuts playing air guitar, singing along to self-esteem and the whole thing. And, <laughs> and, you know, it was, it was all this pop punk, some 41 and somebody else. Um, just, Wow. Really good. All the bands are really good, but I at the same time I've never seen so many singers in a row miss so many notes. And that's a tough genre to sing, especially in your 40s and 50s, you know, it's like pop punk. They're they're going hard, they're singing high. But it kind of made me think like, oh shit, even at like the amphitheater level, people miss notes and, you know, there's flaws and nuances that aren't aren't perfect and it was still like a perfect show in a sense. So, actually that made me feel yeah. a lot better. You know, I mean, it's yeah, only there's people. not really. A, yeah, I mean, there's there's standards, you know, there's self-imposed stuff, whatever. I, I'm still like always kind of like appalled and amazed by stuff that I'll like I'll finish and be like, I, I, I that was terrible. Like I did so bad. And, and then, you know, three months later, or two years later or something, someone's like, my favorite thing you've ever done is when you went on that radio show and missed every note in a row and sang that <laughs> crazy version of whatever. And I'm like, like, thanks. thanks. Yeah. It sucks. Yeah, I had a it's, fucking terrible time. But like, it kind of bends gr- your mind. Like, great. Like, God, there's a, there's a very, just like my piano player, his, his, uh, he was talking about another like famous keys player who would always say to him, He's like, if you're thinking, you're stinking. I'm like, right. I mean, it's true. It's like if you're trying to edit while making stuff, it's bad, you know, mm. because I that slow motion fall <laughs> like uh, I've had some we had a re- really bad. There's some shows that like I can be like, OK, I think we pulled that one out. But there was a there was a long time ago that we were playing at Pilgrimage Fest, which is in outside of Nashville. Yep. It was like the second year, I think, or first year that Pilgrimage Fest was happening. Anyway, we we went out to play and it was just one of those like cursed days where like we stayed up the night before and like had a great time in Nashville and had some drinks and stuff. And then we woke up and our sweet, precious guitar player, Mr. Patrick O'Connor, it was like freaky hot outside it was during the summer or something. And um, he just had not drank water like an adult for a while. And so he was like super duper dehydrated. And we started to go to the show. We were like, Pat, are you okay? He's like, definitely. definitely. And we're like, okay, are you sure? He's like, yeah, fine. And like, eventually, he basically got like heat stroke. And so we forced him to stay home. We're already like, we're a three piece. So now we're down, a, you know, a third of the band. And we're mm-hmm. like, this will be fine. This will be totally okay. And it was just one of those days from the very first, I think from the very first note that I strung, I I broke a string and it was just falling straight down an hour long set at a festival ever since. Like sometimes I have fun where I'm like, oh, a string will break and then I'll be clever and kind of like put it back together. The guitar will go out of tune and I'll make it part of the whatever. And I just never even got to baseline and I had to perform for an hour in front of people in the sun let alone a Nashville crowd, which like, I'm sure mo- everybody in the audience owns their own guitar. And they were like, have mm-hmm. you ever done this before? And I'm like, sure. yes, yes. So and what's the like, move there? Do you do you, when that happens, when you're having like struggles on stage, is the move to call attention to it and be like vulnerable or is the move to just like keep plowing? I, I always opt for the former. Um, you know, there's sometimes that's like, it's not important to draw attention to it, but like no one, most of the time people seem to, I always like it when someone's like, Oh shit. You know, like if they try and play it off, like if your wig blows half off or something and then you're just Mm -hmm. sort of like, that's not a wig. And it's like, well, (laughs) it is like, you know, like, I don't know, like rip it off and throw it into the audience. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. You know, like, I don't think there's anything wrong with, 
with being human about stuff, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that like, it's, it's kind of all there is really. Um, so yeah, I usually opt for trying to let people into my own struggles a little bit. Yeah, that's, that makes sense. I've had, I've done some inner monologue straight into a microphone and I don't know. It, it's, <laughs> I think there's like, there's some redemption to that if it's done in the right way and it's not dragged on too long, but yeah, I think it, you're right. It also has to be, it also has to be something that like, like if you just miss a lyric or, you know, drop a word and then like slow every, you're like, Oh no, we're on the wrong. Like if you skip a verse or something like that, and then mm -hmm. like, maybe no one cares. Like, you don't need to go back and pick that ball back up. You know what I mean? Of course. Yeah. I mean, and hey, I'll be honest, and I've said this before, but I kind of love bombing. Like, I kind of, especially banter wise, like, I kind of, there's like a thrill to it of like digging yourself a deep hole and then just keep saying shit until you eventually either save it with a joke <laughs> or completely fall apart and people start to leave like that excites me and maybe that's fucked up oh. I, I don't know it's definitely fucked up but it's pretty dope too i'm not gonna lie <laughs> I, I i i liked hearing you even just say that but it's 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 not like it's not fucked up that's fucked up <laughs> oh what's the most fucked up show yeah, you've ever played Oh or, or maybe lodging. We can go. Let's go off stage. Lodging, meltdowns. Um, thinking about is there a moment or the closest moment you thought about maybe this isn't for me or um, you thought it might be mm. over? Anything like that? Highlighting some low points. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of low points. There was a I I fired my tour manager and my guitar player on the same day. I, I and then I, I unfired my tour manager. Um, cause it kind of wasn't his fault, but whatever. It was a terrible, again, it was like a festival had to play a festival that then also segued into having to catch a plane and play a festival again. And this was at a time where my tour manager, which is like, there's no reason that anyone who doesn't do stuff like this would really know exactly what a tour manager is because even I played music for a long time and was not aware of what a tour manager is because if you don't have tours to man manage, <laughs> what the fuck is a tour manager? Um, but eventually I just, you know, because it was me as a solo artist for a while, I just asked my best friend in the world. I was like, Hey, like you're not going to drive me insane if we travel around in a van together. So do you want to do this? And he was like, I don't have a job. Fuck it. And so me and my best friend since second grade, like bought a weird conversion van and just chased a tour bus around for a few years. And, um, eventually that grew into like a three piece band and him. But at the same time, it's like n now the tour managers that I've had that I think are the most amazing people are like, they kind of have to be a little bit of a parent in a situation, you know, mm -hmm. like not entirely, but if some, but he's going to be responsible. It's definitely them. It's their job to like help get yep. you from place to place at times. Um, but we didn't know that at the time. And so thus, this was not this guy's job. And we played some festival. And at that point we were all single. And so we, we sort of all the members of the band kind of separated at this festival, including our tour manager. And we're sort of trying to like, we were all like on a date that night. And then it got way hairier where like our tour manager eventually got bored and he decided to leave and couldn't find any of us. So he took the car. So we all got stranded on site at this camping festival oh, shit. and it ended like where I was like, I, we have to be at the airport at like eight this morning. So then I had to like roam around calling my band mates names to try and find like a tent that they would be in, you know? with somebody that they had met that night sure. and eventually rounded them all up, freaked out, got my tour manager together. We were all like zero sleep. We were, we were still kind of in the green about like, we had a really weird night. It was fun. That's hilarious. Great job. Let's go to the airport. We got to the airport and my guitar player was kind of a, um, like a maniac, I guess. 
<laughs> he's one of my favorite guitar players I've ever met, but like just an absolute, like if he went, if he went for it, he was mm. a, uh, a lunatic. Like, and so he, he was like, it's not over. I'm still having a great time. So him and my tour manager decided to go to the bar at the airport as opposed to falling asleep for the bizarre two hours that we had before our plane showed up. Mm -hmm. And they went and they went into like super nuclear platinum too far mode <laughs> where we're like me and my drummer fell asleep for like this terrible hour or two, like on the, on the ground at the airport. And finally we get back up and we're like, where are they? And I just saw from like, you know, 30 yards, like them coming down the airport, you know, the <laughs> walking down the thing. And I was like, this is not going to work. And immediately pretended not to know them. And me and my drummer were both like, oh shit, mm -hmm. like, never mind. Got on the plane. They barely made it to the gate, to like the door of the airplane. And uh, one, I could tell it was bad because my guitar player had coffee, which he never drank for some reason. He was a lunatic about everything else, but coffee like really set him off. So he had a cup of coffee and I was like, this is really bad. And um, I could hear them talking extremely loud behind me and the jet bridge because they thought they were being quiet, but they were really, really drunk. Mm -hmm. And I heard my guitar player lean over and talk to my, my manager. And, and he was like a tour manager. And he was like, man, I haven't been this drunk since I was like in my teens. And my tour manager goes, well, the best part is once we're on the plane, we can get more drinks. And, Jesus. <laughs> my guitar player was sipping his coffee and sprayed it laughing and immediately a flight attendant was like what are you doing and they both were like oh nothing and she was like what the fuck are you guys talking about and just immediately flagged them they got pulled off the plane oh, yeah. while we sat there and then they like fought we were in chicago and then they like fought with the 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 gate attendants got angry and then we had to go play a whole shit. It was like, it was just a nightmare. Did you have to and go I play like a legitimate ourselves. festival? Yeah. We had to play a festival in Houston. That was like the Wu-Tang clan was playing. And all Damn. These yeah. And so we had to play with no guitar player and I had to fire somebody and then be does angry the promoter, at my friend. Even does the promoter get pissed off and be like, Hey, you don't have the whole band contracts, null and void. Nah, well, luckily, to a certain degree, I'm the only person that can kind of null and void a contract like that. Like, mm -hmm. if I show up, if they say whole band and I bring a drummer, I, that can count because technically I've been in two piece before. I'm not okay. going to push that that hard, but hey, that's a <laughs> that's like it's something I could swing, I guess. Anyway, it was very bad. It was like fun times. Like, oh, this is all great. It's fun being a musician. You can do ludicrous stuff and and meet random people and go to faraway places and then fire your friends because they pushed it too far and you're like Ugh. sometimes you gotta fire your friends in life you know dude it fucking sucked it was terrible yeah, and then it was brutal. like yeah anyway it's it's like those those dark days feel really bad they they feel like big you know you you feel like you really let people down or you have a big night and something goes sideways or you just accidentally or mean or something like that you know you spend a lot of time with everybody you tour with it's like you're basically family and roommates and business yeah, partners and I get the it, stakes man. are just really <laughs> really high totally and obviously the alcohol and substances at times floweth freely so nothing uh, nothing, nothing stings more than you know letting somebody down that you love you know or or close to so i feel you yeah, and it was just so weird. It was like once the dust all settled, they were like, "We're so sorry, we didn't mean." I was like, "Look, I get it, but like, I, honestly, I get it. Like, that was just sketchy. Like, shit just got out of hand. I understand, yeah, sure, but sure, but but I'm the boss all of a sudden. So, isn't it weird to be the boss? You can't it's come like, to my house yeah. anymore if my mom said you're fucking super weird. <laughs> yeah. Look at me. I can't even get my phone charged right now. It's like I've dropped this call like three times. Oh, all good, dude. Well, hey, I appreciate up, I think it. I'm about to. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll let you go yeah. to your missions. Um, but yeah, it was great talking to you, Alejandro. And I'm uh, we'll see you down the the line in real life at some point. Any uh, any song you want to steer people to or anything? Just go check out this fucking thing that I've been breaking my mind about. It's gonna be on my website and stuff. It's called we're calling it the Music Machine. It's basically like. My album comes out on Friday, and then if you even look on it, 
there's a bunch of TV screens on the cover, but one of the TV screens is a QR code. So you can go and it's, it's like you basically, it'll give you a little prompt, like what genre of movie do you want to watch? You can type anything into it and it'll generate you a movie and a movie soundtrack based out of these like hundred B sides and alternate takes we have. So it just awesome. makes albums for you. Awesome idea, man. Um, all right. Well, much love shaky graves. We'll see you down the road. Thanks for coming on. We'll chat to you soon. Okay, do good, make good decisions, drink water. <laughs> do good. <laughs> <laughs>